Welcome everybody to the Course of World History. I'm your host, Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at the Italian Renaissance, plus looking at a Ninja Turtle because Ninja Turtles are cool. All right, our essential question, how did Florence begin the Italian Renaissance and then how did it spread? So now we're really digging into the nuts and bolts of the Renaissance and its spread. So Italian history here. During the 1300s, Italy included more than 200 separate states. Italy was really fractured. Lots and lots of different city-states throughout the Italian peninsula. Now, several northern Italian city-states became wealthy by controlling trade across the Mediterranean Sea. But no single power during this time period could control Italy. So many different governments could be formed, and they tried out lots of different things. And uh, a few of them, a couple in general, uh, decided to elect their rulers from amongst the bankers and the merchants. Trade was really important. Trade was what everybody lived and died based on. Uh, so why not put the people in charge of trade and money in charge of the city-state? So the Renaissance really got going in Florence. Florence was its birthplace. And here it was the merchants around the cloth industry that helped make the Florentines wealthy. And people respected these cloth merchants for the jobs that were provided um, within this industry. Now this wealth added to the power of banks because as the cloth merchants were bringing in all this money, they wanted to put it someplace for it to stay safe and maybe make some investment money off of them. So these banks would hold the money of the cloth merchants and uh, then loan it out to others. Now, the Republican government of Florence usually then elected a banker to govern them. They were the ones with the money, they were the ones with the power, and they could influence the uh, citizens of Florence to select them to be the leader. Now, the most powerful banking family in Florence during this time um, became one of those most influential leaders of the Florentine government, that would be the Medici family. Now, the most famous is Lorenzo the Magnificent of uh, Florence, Lorenzo de Medici. Now, he becomes the ruler of Florence in 1469, and uh, he will use his wealth for a very specific purpose. And there's a reason why we study him with the Renaissance is because he wanted to use the wealth of the Florentine state and his personal wealth to support artists and scholars, to advance the art of the city, beautify the city, and also to advance the learning and make Florence a center for scholarship and knowledge within Europe. He was a humanist who believed in the ideas of um, enjoying life on earth, that it wasn't all about the afterlife. And as a humanist, he also wanted to revive the world of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and those cultures. So under his leadership, Florence becomes a center for art and learning and a place where the best and brightest in Europe want to go. The city is transformed by this. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici takes the time to find the most skilled architects in Europe and bring them to the city to redesign and rebuild the city. Outdoor, uh, outdoor sculptures appear throughout the city and parks, places where people can relax. Um, the city itself, the landscape of it becomes transformed during this time. Now, a thing that becomes a, uh, a key aspect of Renaissance art is this human uh, element. Renaissance artists and writers wanted to show the world the way it really was. Not an idealized version of the world, not just looking at history and the way it was, but showing the world as it is. So there's a focus on realism and making images and art appear as they are, characters and plays appearing as they are. Books that aren't just history and religion, but start to tell stories. These are all elements of Renaissance art uh, and aligned with Lorenzo's own humanist philosophy. Now, several artists and writers um, during this time were thought to be born with this special gift. Like it was 
within their being to be an artist. And we call these individuals at the time geniuses. So Renaissance artists created a number of these geniuses. In the Middle Ages, nearly all writing was religious and history. All literature was in Latin, a language that only church members, uh, church leaders could really read. Um, but now we have that switch. If this is going to be humanist, if it's going to be about life on earth written for the people on earth, we want to write stories that can communicate to the people. So Dante, this fellow, still religious in nature with most of his writing, but he starts to write stories in Italian that can be consumed by people outside of the church. In England, we get Chaucer and Shakespeare who start to write in English, not Latin, so that the people can read and understand the stories. And their stories have characters that are relatable. They're not perfect, idealized religious figures. They are instead human with all the faults that humanity comes with. Now, another advancement in this uh, area of getting knowledge to the people was in 1450s when Johann Gutenberg takes the idea of Chinese woodblock printing and modifies, adapts, and improves upon it to create the printing press. Now, his invention quickly spreads, and by 1500, there are thousands of printed books in Europe. Books used to be an extreme luxury because every book in Europe was printed by hand. And think about how long it takes for somebody to write by hand a book, and that has to be paid for. It's extremely expensive, but once you can have a printing press and whip out a hundred copies of a book fairly easily, then the cost comes down. The availability of the books increases and more people can then have access to books and to literature and to read. The printing costs um, made literature affordable to the middle class in Europe. Which brings about Leonardo da Vinci. He is a perfect example of this Renaissance man who is good at many things and lived at the perfect time to be a Renaissance man. He was born in Italy in 1452. He was an artist. He was a scientist. He was an innov uh, innovator. He invented things. Um, he was not actually a Ninja Turtle, although Leonardo, of course, well, you know, maybe he was. He was the Leonardo of his time, yeah. Leonardo da Vinci, though, really does change the world in a lot of ways. He leaves behind dozens of scientific notebooks so that others can follow his um, steps that he took in um, approaching his learning and his experimentation. He carefully recorded his observations of the world, world, not word, that's a misspelling, um, which included his <laughs> dissection of uh, human corpses. I didn't spell check this one very well. Um, his notebooks advance the understanding of human anatomy and helps people really understand what's going on inside our body. Um, he also included, you know, ideas for inventions, including the ideas for a submarine and for flying machines. The idea of a machine gun was Leonardo da Vinci's. And these all come about long before the invention of the actual product, but the concept was there and others follow his thinking and do the actual inventing. So how does this all go into decline? Why isn't Florence the leader of culture and learning in the world today? Well, it comes about um, after Lorenzo de' Medici's death in 1492. And religious authorities in Florence really start to push back against his reforms. The religious authorities start to think, you know, we're too focused on the worldly. We're not enough focused on getting into heaven. Florence has become so nice. You know, we want heaven to seem like the nicest thing in the world. So um, Lorenzo was declared a tyrant by uh, these religious figures and a following that, that came up around them, uh, believing that he had steered the people away from their true belief and their true calling. And uh, the church begins to speak out against the spirit of the Renaissance. And people are asked to burn their worldly possessions. And in Florence, they wind up having this 
huge bonfire. It's much larger than it appears in this particular picture. Um, where people are burning their, their books and their finery, their new art and all this stuff that represents the worldly desires of man and distracts them from the religious significance of heaven and the church. Um, and they call this giant burning the bonfire of the vanities. And as, Ro as uh, Florence is doing this, other cities around them are learning from what Florence did. They are taking these Renaissance ideas and not burning them afterward. And Rome will soon pass Florence as the uh, leader of the Italian Renaissance. And then, of course, it spreads to other places as well. Um, so that is it for today. I do hope that you enjoyed this lesson on uh, the Renaissance and its spread. And I will uh, see you next time. Farewell.